Hello. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, we'll wait another couple of minutes for everyone to join. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Um, this is a, a series six of our webinar, Great Changes, Great Women, and an absolute pleasure and privilege to have Susan Scott Parker with us today. Um, and I will give you some um, housekeeping introduction. Over yep. to you, Anna. Hello, everyone. Um, so we are getting through this series of Great Change, Great Women. Um, so it's 6th of May, we have Susan Scott Parker, OBE, who is an internationally recognized creative thought leader on how to mobilize business leadership worldwide behind the economic and social inclusion of people with disabilities. Um, our housekeeping section is, there will be a Q&A at the end, so please put any questions in the chat. Please be at all times respectful to others. We want everyone to feel welcome, safe and respected. Our accessibility features are captioning service provided by MyClearText. Thank you very good. Uh, thank you once again. Switch on the captioning at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Closed captioning shows subtitles if you'd like to have the captions on. And you can follow the conversation on social media. Hashtag Great Change Great Women. So, Susan, are you ready for this? Because NASA has some disarming questions, um, and and I know that you're you're great friends anyway, so I'm, I'm not going to say too much, but okay. if there's any pause in the conversation, I will interject. <laughs> okay. okay. So NASA. Uh, yeah. have... Well, actually, um, uh, Anna, would you um, give a very quick bio of Susan? Because sure, sure. I, think, I think it would do her injustice if we <laughs> don't spend two hours just talking about her achievements. Her achievements, yes, I know. Only, well, we've only got one hour, I'm afraid, but so we're going to be very quick with the bio, but certainly all that will be sent uh, by email once we, uh, we, we give you the recording as well. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I'll just try to highlight some of it. Um, so Susan founded the world's first business disability network, now Bus Business Disability Forum in the UK, and its technology task force. Um, BDF launched the first benchmarking tool to measure a corporation's disability related performance across the business um, under her leadership and the, the world's first leadership development program for persons with disabilities. In 2016, she established Business Disability International with Barclays, GSK and Infosys and leads its global procurement task force. Um, and there's so many, there's so many um, accolades um, she works with IBM, Oxford, Brooks University Institute, um, the Visconti Centre, the European Disability Forum, um, heads up the global campaign addressing the fast growing uh, risk to the life chances of persons with disabilities generated by AI powered recruitment tools and by HR tech more widely. Um, and sits on a steering group with the Global Action on Disability Network and is technical advisor on labor market reengineering in Bangladesh, Kenya, Nigeria, Nigeria and Uganda for inclusive futures. Um, I will stop there because the list is on and on and on. But 
yes, it's impressive. <laughs> thank you for joining us today, Susan. Thank you. And thank you very much, Susan, indeed. I, I always, um, I, it would be a privilege to say she's my friend, uh, but she's much more than that. Uh, uh, Susan has always been my mentor. Mm -hmm. I've, uh, I've learned so much from her. From when I joined BDF uh, 2008, um, I mean, she really took me under her wings. And, and a lot of the things we do today is because of um, her, 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 her kind of mentoring and leadership that she's, she's kind of taught us and gave us a real vision of how we could make the world a better place. So, I mean, as I said, anything we, will tell, we, we say here is not enough. But Susan, I think you need to tell us a bit more about yourself. I really think people would love to know how you got here, the journey, where you, why you came to UK to do what you did. Just give us a bit background of what made Susan Scott Parker what she is. I never know how to answer questions like that. So the short version is probably I'm a Canadian and I came to the UK for adventure um, because I was living in a place that you could not consider to be at the center of the civilized world where the winters were 45 below and the summers were 90 above and anyway, I won't go there. And so um, I have been working with organizations of persons with disabilities in Canada and I found myself in a country that wouldn't let me do something new. Everybody asked, what have you already done? And so <laughs> I was up for a reason for ending up in the disability space because I don't like looking for work. Hmm, no. I think what happened was I found myself working with a management consultancy, a really interesting company called Coverdale that taught me so much about how you get things done working in groups, bringing teams of people together. And in the course of that program, um, I came across Tom Yentop, who was an individual thalidomide, no arms, photographer, really interesting guy. And I persuaded the company to bring him into one of these management training courses that lasted four and a half days in a hotel, some, in some forest somewhere. And that was the trigger for the idea of a leadership development program. But at the same time, um, I was approached by business in the community they were running a conference, 100 companies who were being asked, why weren't they delivering the 3% quota that was established in World War II? And what you heard then in that event prompted me to think the time had come to actually bring the companies together to say, if it's too hard for you now to get the advice you need, to get the technical support you require to attract suitable candidates, to persuade your board that this is worth doing, um, then it was time for the companies to say, we need to joint fund a small team that would make it easier for us to get this right. And then with luck, help the disability sector to do a better job meeting the needs of employers so that more disabled people would get a better deal. So it all sort of just came out of that. Yep. And um, obviously it couldn't have been very easy um, I mean, where we are today, just imagine 25 years ago. So what barriers did you face? What problems did you have to fix? What, I don't know, doors did you have to knock down in order to get people to see the true worth and value of disability inclusion? Well, I think the first thing was understanding that all too often the business people I was talking to would say, but I don't meet people with disabilities. I meet government officials telling me I have to be a better person or something. And I, I meet charities that talk about disabled people, but I don't meet them. And so one of the first things I did was to create that network of associates, um, people like you know, Simon Minty, Phil Friend, Kate Nash, Alice Maynard, you know, the list goes on, distinguished, wonderful people, James Partridge, sadly no longer with us. Um, and started to facilitate the conversations between business leaders and leaders with disabilities face-to-face, -face. we call it the face-to-face -face strategy, and reinforce that with that leadership development program that you mentioned, Anna. Worked so brilliantly, where we brought high capacity people like Kate Nash, who was our first graduate on this program, and then she ended up naturally managing it, wouldn't you know, that's Kate. We brought her in and she would say, go into Barclays for a three-day course on marketing 
alongside Barclays managers. She was just dropped in on her bursary. Those managers after three days with Kate would never have the same set of assumptions about disability ever again. Kate gets the marketing skills she needs as she's setting up her, her enterprise. And you start to build connections, mm -hmm. leader to leader, between business and people with disabilities. I mean, the best example of how that really worked, I mean, cast your mind back, James Partridge uh, and we did an event at the House of Lords looking at face equality, facial disfigurement, and it was sponsored by Sky Television. Really, really fantastic event. And we had senior players from Sky, probably the chief executive himself, at the event talking about face equality. A few days later, posters start to go up all over London saying ugliness demeans us all. Sky TV running a program on um, cosmetic surgery. Mm. Now, before we started out, someone like James would have written to every newspaper he could find and just trashed the company for the hypocrisy of sponsoring this event on face equality and then doing that. Instead, he picked up the phone to the chief exec and say, what's going on? And the chief exec said, oh my God, I didn't know that and canceled the whole campaign. Because mm, I mean. two leaders coming together, getting a common understanding of what this was all about, not judging people on the basis of appearance. It's interesting how hard to sell that one is. Eh? Mm. And, and that's, that's, that's what really drives the change is mm. people getting to know each other and the stereotypes about business fall over, the stereotypes about disabled people fall over, because you're not talking about 1.3 billion people anymore, you're talking about George and Harriet and Amy, changes everything. But I think the, um, I must admit, having business in the community with us at the start, and with His Royal Highness Prince of Wales acting as our kind of ambassador, that didn't hurt, mm. because when he would invite people to a dinner, even if the word disability was in the invite, they'd turn up. Mm -hmm. And then they'd meet really interesting people with disabilities at the dinner, and suddenly it would be easier to get them to the second dinner. Mm -hmm. And of course, we had Prince Charles at that point. He was brilliant. He would, he would when he had to go to open a, an airport, he would say, this is a nice airport. Where is the accessible toilet? May I see it, please? <laughs> oh, gosh. That is I think that's exactly what you need. <laughs> taught me so much about all senior players have to do sometimes is just show it matters. Just ask the question. Mm -hmm. And suddenly people knew that the next time you went to open a building, they'd better well have a really nice toilet for him to go and inspect when he went in. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and that element of um, senior leaders, um, how easy was it to get a meet with them and get them to talk and this yeah, conversation? It was hard work. So it was, it took what, 10, 12 years before we actually got uh, to the point where senior leaders would open the doors, have the conversations, come to dinner in a routine way. So I think the breakthrough for me was when John Varley became our president. Um, he was chief exec of Barclays Global at the time. He was honorary president and for seven years, he just quietly got the message out that this was an a commercial and ethical imperative, and it was time for the senior guys to come to the table. So he helped me to set up that president's group. So at one point we had about 45 um, people coming to dinner, C-suite, at every table, of course, we've got one of our interesting associates or a disabled person from some walk of life who's there as a peer to challenge and enjoy the dinner. Um, and I mean, I was, you know, Caroline Casey and that brilliant work she's doing with Valuable 500, she'll tell you that when I first met her in Ireland, I said something like, but it took me 15 years to get chief execs to the table. You're starting backwards. What do you mean you're starting with chief executives? That she's always been better at. Oh, wow. um, has done an extraordinary job ever since. Well, I'm sure she will acknowledge she could not have done it without the work you had done 15 years before. I'm, I'm, I'm sure she will always acknowledge the great work you've actually, legacy you've left uh, for her and Kate Nash. Everyone will acknowledge that those early days must have been very tough, but you've managed to do it. Well, I think the trick was being really upfront. Um, they had to pay um, because why would you give away something so valuable as learning how to improve your business performance? Why would you mm -hmm. give that away? Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we started with five companies, six companies maybe at the table and being very practical. The task was to make it easier for these organizations to change. So you had to listen, identify what they were saying was too hard and make it easier. So very practical focus, practical guidelines, uh, helplines, um, problem solving gatherings, you know, and working up to the standard. Because if you don't know what to do, you're not going to even try, are you? That's one of NASA's favorite phrases, what you don't know what you don't know. And so well, if there, you pave the way for people to understand um, more about disability and how, how everything should be equal for everyone. <laughs> so um, I, I do want to ask you one question. Why did you launch this phrase disability confidence and what were you trying to achieve with that? Oh, yeah. Well, the essence of the change model, I guess, that we were working to was first you have to capture the attention of the senior business leaders. You have to have a, the conversation with them. But what we found, and this is still true in many places in the world, is the only real conversation with business on disability is that aggressive, so why don't you hire disabled people? Mm. And that tends to lead to rather short conversations. And it certainly doesn't lead to kind of productive ongoing dialogue. So I thought we just needed a different language, a different discourse, if you like. So in effect, I wanted to be able to say, um, why uh, would you be interested in investing in learning how to deliver the best practice that benefits the business and your disabled colleagues and potential colleagues and customers? That's quite a mouthful. So I just branded best practice disability confidence. So are you interested in disability confidence, meaning developing this best practice? And, the, and then I defined it. And I think as I watched the way the language has kind of gone all over, people, I, I would like to remind people that it, it should have a robust definition. It has four components. You understand how disability affects your business. You remove obstacles for groups, the accessible websites, ramps. You adjust for individuals, you know, microlinks home territory yep. and you don't make assumptions about people on the basis of labels particularly medical labels and so you you've got the facts you're barrier free for groups you're adjusting for individuals and no blanket exclusions blind people can't use the internet kind of stuff and then you can define what those companies need to do and learn in order to make that real and that becomes a standard uh, so sometimes you hear disability confidence used kind of just generally, like I feel more confident having a glass of wine with a blind colleague. Well, that's okay too. That personal confidence is, is important. But when I was applying it to organizations, I was trying to set a framework for a really rigorous approach that said, this isn't just about your HR people, it's about your technology and the property and your procurement guys who are using suppliers that are getting in the way when you're trying to adjust for individuals, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, I'm, I'm really pleased how it's taken off. I, it really has. I mean, even the government uses it. Mm -hmm. Even the government. They would apologize <laughs> to me for taking the term, but I think no, it was, my point wasn't to actually stop people from using it. No, but it's also very, very positive. Yeah. It's, because because yeah. you're right. Whenever you mention the word disability, it, it it shuts people down or the doors kind of close a little bit <laughs> slower, you know. <laughs> but, but actually, that, when, when do you think that the sub, that the, the word disability became less scary and more, actually, it is fact of life. We all live with it. Do you think it has become that? I'm not sure. Hmm. I, I, I think the um, people are more openly talking about it. You know, as you know, mental health um, is a lot of conversation on mental health. That's true. That itself somehow is um, maybe expose people to the to the word to the culture of disability. And I, but I, as you said, um, I'm not sure if everyone gets it, but certainly a lot of a lot more people than they used to. Well, I think the shift there is. Um, coming to see that the difference between thinking about disability almost like sickness, you know, that mm. people who say uh, uh, are diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, mm. 
if you've if you've got the kind of old brain on disability, the well-intentioned manager says, "Well, that's that's really uh, sorry to hear. Why don't you go home and the doctors will take care of you?" And they lose their jobs. But a disability confident manager says. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. But while the doctors are doing their thing, what can I do in the office to help you and make it easier for you to do your job? Mm -hmm. And I think we're still struggling a bit with that shift. Mm -hmm. um, that it's a, and then of course the next shift is, and furthermore, um, when I do make adjustments for you so you can do your job and they're reasonable and sensible, um, I'm making equal opportunities possible because mm -hmm. that's not special treatment, that's fair and equitable treatment. And I still think a lot of people are struggling with the idea that um, there's fundamentally no difference turning me down for a job because I'm disabled and turning me down for a job because I'm a woman or a Canadian. I, I think we're still trying to get that rights-based equality message through and that jumping to the language of inclusion, that kind of abstraction, um, can make it more difficult because there's a kind of assumption when you look at diversity preference list, you know, that go race and gender and age and family and sometimes disabilities on at the very end. It is. The question is that people are being treated fairly, which is why we can focus on gender now and focus on race next year, right? It's a sequence mm -hmm. thing. Whereas it's very difficult to argue that many organizations are actually delivering equal opportunities for disabled people now, whether it's customers or or employees. So why am I talking about this? Remind me, what were we talking about? Oh, we're talking about disability confidence. Um, oh, right. disability and, confidence. And, then, and then the next question I'm going to ask, if you don't mind, Nas, if I jump in. No, um, please do, please do. Um, Barclays um, and GSK and Infosys, they um, supported you setting up Business Disability International. So that may, means you've gone out now from the Isle of... Um, of the UK from the, the beautiful shores of the United Kingdom and now you're out there in the world with the help of these organizations mm -hmm. so what so I guess what you're doing now is replicating the success you've had with business disability forum um, and now you're sending that ripple out there into onto the planet which is very, well, very it's, cool. it's not a replication if you like because it's not a business membership organization oh, okay I didn't um, know that okay. we we thought that you know back in 2014 when we were looking at setting something up with that would work explicitly at global head office multinationals we thought that um, a membership based organization might be possible but actually it was before its time mm. in that mm. for most global companies they are they don't have global strategies on disability yet mm. they're leaving it to their national leaders in the, you know, the local circumstances to get it right. So, but what we did find, of course, was that there was considerable interest in what global head office of any multinational needs to do to empower national leaders mm -hmm. to deliver consistent best practice worldwide and considerable interest in how you build a different relationship with business if you're government or the NGO sector or the disability sector or advocates so that you can harness the power of businesses, allies and partners behind the aspirations of disabled people. So I'm doing a lot of work with the ILO and their Global Business Disability Network. And we're looking now at a project that's going to consider how the business disability networks in China, Indonesia, Philippines can actually influence their local labor market. So it becomes easier for their employers to recruit people with disabilities who have got the digital skills and qualifications that those companies are looking for. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to look at pipelines that would normally deliver digitally qualified people into the companies, trying to get people with disabilities into those mainstream pipelines or having particular pipelines tailored to meet the needs of persons with disabilities if the mainstream isn't going to work in the short term. So there's some very interesting work there at bringing the insight that if the disability sector that's trying to bring people into work forges a new way of working with the companies, you get much better success rates. I mean, when you look at the uh, bridge academies in the States, 
working with populations of persons with disabilities that would normally the programs would get 20 to 30 percent into jobs if that they're getting 70 to 80 percent into jobs wow. Wow. because they've that, that is incredible. tailored the training and they've got not just the qualifications now that the employers are looking at but they've got employers clustered around these training programs saying well we'll offer internships we'll offer guaranteed interviews you know trying to expedite that process from getting the certification to getting the job. It's really quite exciting. Yeah. Uh, my, my own personal journey in this um, sector, um, as I said, I've learned so much of it from the work you had done with Business Disability Forum. Uh, we, we used to come across three types of organizations. Those who just blank said, we don't have any disabled people. I, I, we don't employ many because no one tells us. The second ones, they said, okay, we do know we have some, but we don't know what to do about it. And third one, they said, well, it must cost a lot of money. <laughs> all, 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 all three of those, thanks to your, again, the work you, you did with a, a case study for Lloyd's Banking Group in 2015, it completely destroyed the myth about, one, there aren't many people who need help, two, it's not difficult to fix those, and third, it doesn't cost too much. You know, we're, that large uh, case study is still being um, passed around and shared globally. Um, even the German government did a, a research uh, and, um, you know, they did a project and they came up as best practice based on that particular model. So I think, I think the, the conversation we are having nowadays with companies is not about how much does it cost. Uh, they would often say, are we ready for it? We want to do it, but we may not be in a position we can. But I think, though, that we're also seeing a switch from, I'm only going to make an adjustment for you. I mean, my favorite example is a left-handed mouse. I mean, if you need a left-handed mouse, do you have to prove you're disabled according to legislation? Is left-handed oh, nice. going to be enough? Not in many jurisdictions. I don't know. But if, of course, what it means is if you're using the wrong mouse, your hand starts to go, and then you become disabled. Oh, and then you qualify for accommodations in New Jersey. You know, it's really crazy. But I do think that the, the insight that what we need is, in terms of the, the business community, is we need to give everyone the tools, flexibility, and accessibility they need in order to do their jobs. And so that's just about everybody. And you need disability expertise if you're going to do that, because many of the solutions might look like assistive devices that people with disabilities would you know, normally require. But the... The premise is we're giving everyone the tools they need. And I think surely COVID has brought that home now. People are seeing that actually, well, I was listening to a woman from Google talking the other day about how they just gave everybody a thousand dollars and said, get fixed up, right? No. They didn't say, well, is this worth the bother? I well, actually most people go I, to IKEA. Well, I did I am one of my one of my relatives works for Google and he told me that. I said, What did you do with the money? He said I bought furniture to match the room decor. <laughs> so <laughs> it was good. Um didn't do much for his comfort, but certainly it bought him some furniture, which I, I do believe uh some companies now realised it wasn't the right thing to do. No. Well, but you would kind of trust your people, I guess, at one level to know what they needed in order to work comfortably. But I, I have to admire them for just not getting bogged down in who qualifies. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, actually, uh, just to give the money. Uh, well, the, what we achieved uh, using this um, concept of a social model of disability, like workplace adjustment instead of reasonable adjustment, is we were uh, we had a toolkit, a toolbox that people needed different tools to do their, their work. And essentially, this is what my health condition is doing to me, how it impacts my work. Can I find something that makes me do my job better? Quite straightforward, no medical, no expertise required from a doctor to tell us to do that. But I went to Google once and I was talking to them, they were showing me around. And I said, uh, so we said, oh, this is our IT desk. If you need a different machine to work with, you just come and ask and they give it to you. I said, well, you could have a 17 inch uh, Mac Pro. Oh, yes. If the uh, work needs you, you get one. No justification needed. So I said, well, if you had somebody who was disabled who said, I want a piece of software. Yeah, that's a bit tricky. <laughs> you have to go and uh, get that um, approved. That is the, really the problem that I found. There's a lovely switch around that. A big American company was telling me in the middle of the COVID thing 
that their policy in terms of making adjustments for disabled people included making adjustments at home. So suddenly everyone's working from home. So they were happily paying for the kit that their disabled colleagues needed at home, but their non-disabled colleagues who also needed kit had to pay for it themselves. Now that's right. the only time that I've ever seen the obligation to make accommodations actually work in favor of disabled people and disadvantage <laughs> their non-disabled colleagues who had to pay for the stuff themselves. They were revising that policy last time I heard. So we'll, right. we'll see where it goes. Well, we definitely know since the COVID, um, the number of people reporting um, back pain and neck and shoulder issues has gone up by 71%. So it's a huge problem, as well as the mental health aspect. The worry is uh, um, post-COVID, these people will develop a more serious condition, which will go back to the old issue. If you don't deal with it uh, from the early stages, uh, you're going to pay a lot more and the cost to the employee's future is much higher as well. And uh, but going back to the, the rollout to different countries, obviously cultural differences, uh, legal barriers. Are there any countries that are better than others right now on a, like a league table of maturity? I don't think so. <clears throat> I think the, um, the UK can hold its head up, absolutely. Hmm. Um, at least, most of the companies in the UK have some insight into the obligation to make adjustments. And I don't see a lot of overt compliance. You know, you have to get a letter from your doctor to prove you're disabled before I'll give you your left-handed mouse stuff. We don't see a lot of that here. Mm -hmm. um, but it varies greatly from country to country. Getting the balance right between a regulatory environment that's really credible for business and disabled people uh, and backed by equality bodies that actually really uh, if effectively communicate to the general public that disability, the way we look at it now, you know, the new brain stuff that I talk about is about rights and equality. It's not about doctor appointments and social workers. Of course, everybody needs help occasionally, but what we're talking about is how do we ensure people with disabilities under the say the convention on the rights of persons with disabilities how they access everything everybody else accesses as fully valued citizens um, but most equality bodies don't spend a lot of time helping the daily mail to communicate in a fresh way on this subject or the evening standard or the times and so the irony is I think many of the business disability networks around the world are doing a better job communicating on disability than the very equality bodies that are supposed to be. Which okay. one stands out to you? When, you when, when you when you say that there's other organizations and networks communicating better, uh, more effectively, the, yeah, who stands the, out? The Australian business disability Australian, network yeah. is doing a particularly good job and they've got a very robust online recruit, well, recruitment audit, which includes the online, usually hugely problematic component. Um, the, so what I like about their model is all the messaging is just as you would want it to be, but they've got the really practical tools behind it. So you pay three and a half thousand dollars, something like that, if you're a large corporate, for them to spend what can be a year in a consultancy mode, helping you to spot the barriers in your recruitment process at every mm. stage and remove those barriers. You can't just identify them, you have to remove that. them. And then you get the ability to use this little logo that says disability confident recruiter, but you can only use it for a year. And then you have to pay again so they mm -hmm. can audit you again to make sure that some new HR person hasn't come in and messed it up. No, interesting, we, we actually started doing that uh, here for a lot of the companies and we would do them an audit of their disability adjustment program because most people don't really know what's missing. They, they do, I, we, we've actually come across a lot of organizations really, really passionately care, they want to do it, but they just don't know where to, to go to. So it does help them. And Anna, what were you going to say there? I was going to say that's a, that's a government um, No, effort. no, it's the it's a it's A and E. They've okay. got hundreds of business members. They're funded entirely by their business members. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm saying they're charging these companies 
for the service that their own network gives them to audit mm -hmm. their online process as part of that, though they are now reviewing it. And I'm expecting that they're going to be doing much more in terms of the artificial intelligence threat mm -hmm. that I'm sure we'll be talking about later. Yeah, that's, what, that's my next question. <laughs> but the point I make is that these companies are paying for the, the rigor that means that they can say not just we're barrier free uh, and we're checking that every year to make sure we stay that way. But now that they can turn to their recruitment agencies and say, I want you to have a disability competent recruiter review as well, so that you're not using recruitment services that are inaccessible and wondering why they're not sending you disabled candidates. So it's a nice way of building the capacity of the supply chain in terms of talent as well. And why aren't, why isn't the UK doing the same thing? In I your opinion? Know. You don't know. Hmm. Um, it's that maturity that they have to reach, but um, it comes from great leadership. And I think Susan um, uh, in, in, in Australia, it, she's doing a great job. I've spoken to her, a lot of admiration for her. Um, Susan, uh, about uh, private versus public sector, do you see oh, yeah. practices differ or do you think there's one doing better job than the other? What can they learn from each other? Well, my heart goes out to the public sector quite often. Their world is very complex. Um, yeah, uh, global pharmaceutical companies complicated, but they've got more flexibility. They can move faster when they decide to. Um, I think for most government public sector bodies, they, they really struggle to be flexible in the way that we would expect in terms of making adjustments in recruitment or to, for their people. They, um, their decision-making process is very cumbersome and then they get new ministers and everything changes. I mean, it's, it's a complicated mm -hmm. world. I know that there was some interest from the Canadian government in bringing various um, governments together in a network as employers to look at how they could share best practice. Um, but I don't know where that's going to go. At the moment, thanks to your introduction, Nasser, I know that the Global Government Forum is planning to do a series of webinars for their members and linked to the ILO's work um, because of course the ILO in terms of the United Nations itself having its own disability strategy that commitment to deliver. Um, I think there's, there's a lot that can be done in that sector but it won't be easy for the champions there to challenge these really cumbersome complex rule bound systems. We, we had early engagement with the Canadian civil service but because of COVID that's all gone quiet, very quiet. So I, I believe um, they wanted, they determined to do something to try to address the issues. As you sent me the report about the survey of several thousand civil servants who were not very happy with the service they were getting. Well, I think the, um, what, what, we're, what we're facing, not just in the public sector, is the fact that no one at senior level is explicitly responsible for enhancing productivity mm -hmm. across a business right. or a government department. And so it means that there's a kind of default assumption that somehow HR is responsible for making adjustments, for getting you the kit, for getting facilities management to give you a new parking bay because suddenly you need one. Um, even though everybody kind of knows it doesn't work, it's not clear who should own the process. And so for me, the image is always you know, Amazon knows that their task is to get this request package, you know, I need a white pen. Mm -hmm. And so the request goes in and it gets barcoded and that the challenge is to get it delivered as quickly as possible with as few stops along the way as possible. So when you're talking about most adjustments that require some input from a manager who says, okay, the light bulb does give you uh, migraines and then it has to go to facilities management and then it wasn't in the contract and it's not clear who's going to pay and the IT guys get involved because of that and 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 so my light bulb story of course is from someone who waited 18 months with migraines caused by those lights because the organization couldn't figure out how to coordinate all the players in the process that would deliver that the light bulbs that she needed so we need chief productivity officers Chief productivity officers, I like that. And their job is to coordinate who needs to do what in every department so that 
someone needs an adjustment which requires maybe a little bit of Oc Health, but hardly ever much, maybe a bit of a kit, maybe uh, IT guys have to do something different, maybe facilities have to do something different. When it has to line them all up, you need someone up here who says, I want that to take no more than 20 days. Hmm. Yeah, because if, if you start to put a time limit on it, and in very few organizations have time limits, it just takes as long as it takes, doesn't it? <laughs> And, and, and I, I do know from several um, different experiences that the, the cost of those adjustments, a lot of companies pay way above what we found that should be reasonable, like about six, seven hundred pounds in UK. They're spending the money, but it's taking a lot longer to actually get the results, even though they spend twice or three times that amount. So it's absolutely right. There's no, no one in charge of the overall outcome. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know that I'll live long enough to see chief productivity officers, but maybe if we start talking. Why not? We start putting it out there. You know, well, I really like that. A CPO. But wasn't there a reason? Sorry, but I think. Uh, sure. Yeah, sorry. Please. Sorry, I interrupted. I'm just saying to Anna, we'll have to look at the branding or they'll think we're talking yeah. procurement. <laughs> no, it's actually the um, recently they're, they're starting recruiting people for chief remote working officer. So, oh, yeah. so these things can happen if they yeah. realize there is a bigger benefit. Uh, so we will actually coin phrase it and uh, attribute it to you like the yeah. business I'm disability gonna confidence. That. We're going to tweet it. So it's Susan's idea. She has lots um, of ideas for this, but I, I, can, I get, can I ask the question? Why yeah. are you so worried about the impact of AI in recruitment? Ah, ah my favorite obsession, okay. Yeah, the latest one. <laughs> the latest obsession, yeah. Well, because it's, um, it's really high risk territory. So what we're seeing is, I mean, my story started when I read an article about Hireview, um, was in The Guardian, and it was saying that Hireview was proud of the fact that they had removed human bias by introducing a, a standardized process. And I thought, but, Everybody knows a standardized process means rigid, means you're not flexing or adapting for disabled candidates. So it's discriminatory from day one. I mean, I'm, so I'm reading this thinking this can't be true, but of course it is true. And so when you start to look at it, you've got artificial intelligence powered recruitment tools, whether it's CV sifting or assessing your personality on the strength of a 60 second interview with some algorithm that decides that actually you're trustworthy or you're not. And, um, and the, the intention here, of course, for many companies is simply to manage the fact that now thousands and thousands of people can apply to you, often randomly actually, online. And so they're trying to find a way to discard as many candidates as quickly as they can. But what it means, of course, is particularly uh, in low-income countries, which is my primary concern at the moment, mm. is that if you've got, if it becomes fashionable to use these tools, which I stress have no scientific validity, they haven't been validated with populations of people with a whole range of disabilities. If they're doing things like you have three minutes to answer that question, oh, but you stammer and you need an extra 15 tough. Um, you've got the robot recruit recruiter in Sweden that is supposed to be free of all human bias and it's a white painted female robot to hear. And would she be looking at the interpreter when it's a deaf person using the interpreter? Is she, you know, has somebody taught her not to look at the interpreter and assess the, <laughs> it goes on and on. But my point is, as these things become fashionable, then when you go to Nairobi and many multinationals, of course, have got operations in Nairobi, it's going to cascade down. Now at the moment, if you can't get through an online recruitment process for company X in Paris or here, you can probably jump to another company that's not using it yet. And maybe you'll have a chance there. But if it becomes fashionable in two or three or four years in a place like Nairobi, there won't be anywhere to jump. No. The labor market will be dominated in terms of the the whole talent process, recruitment process, by assessments that are knocking out people with non-standard faces, imagine facially disfigured and you can't make eye contact, or you know, um, 
or autistic. They, they oh, don't like oh, it goes on and on and on. I mean, yeah. it, it's crazy. I mean, how can a robot analyze a human, the human element? I mean, you know, there are, there are some extraordinary people who haven't got an education but are incredibly creative. And they're just discounted because they don't have a degree, let alone a disability. And to be and to be fair, that would happen with a human, often a recruiter, a human recruiter. Yeah, if they were doing a tick. So, so what I find from the AI developers, they they say, well, human beings are biased, so why should my technology be more unbiased than a human? And I say, well, of course, the point is that human bias is randomly encountered. You might get lucky with the next interviewer who yeah. says, well, I don't care if you've got a degree or not. Talk to me about what you can do. Yeah. But if you're using um, artificial intelligence, machine learning in your process, it's consistently biased. It always knocks out it's everything. Always biased, yes. It takes three minutes, 15, mm -hmm. right? And so I'd rather have random human bias than programmed systematic bias. Mm -hmm. What? Wasn't there a real case recently where uh, AI uh, recruitment tool actually excluded women from the post? Oh, that was the, that's the famous Amazon story. Because, yeah. of course, the data that they use is what the employer has. Right. And so they look at people you've got, this is the hire of you stuff, and say, and then the employer says, I want someone just like the successful manager over in department A. And then they go and look for someone who looks like the successful manager in department A. And hardly any of those guys need captions because they're hearing impaired. So suddenly you're doing video interviews with no captions. That's where my little headline of how do you lip read a robot came from, right? <laughs> they're just not there. But the, the other thing, of course, mm -hmm. is um, that the, uh, the regulators aren't up to speed on this. So the individual who is discriminated against in the process can you imagine how long it's going to take to prove that an algorithm treated you unfairly? Which is why, you know, we're calling for a switch here so that we've got, yes, of course, the individual can take their cases to court, but the developers would have to, in terms of almost consumer protection regulations, prove that these artificial intelligence recruitment tools are safe before they can put them on the market. And that's where the work that the Institute for Ethical AI at Oxford Brooks is interesting because they're hoping to develop a process where the developer can go to them and they will assess the extent to which their product poses a risk to the life chances of disabled and other people. Are you getting um, traction on an alliance to try to bring um, more focus and attention to this practice? Well, we're kind of just you know making it up as we go, but the, we've got strong support from IBM. I have to really commend their partnership on this. So we've got Yves Bouillet, Global Disability Lead for, for IBM in a leadership role there. Bob Booth, um, who's now looking at taking IBM's paper on the six steps to fairness and implementing it internally so that IBM becomes much more comfortable advising the companies that it works with on the risks and what to do about this in terms of at least looking carefully at the ethics whenever you are purchasing this technology. Um, New York University has just come in recently and so I just recorded a lecture for their data science uh, undergrad program. Lisbon University has come in. Uh, the World Bank are very interested because of course uh, they encountered the problem with facial recognition technology. I think it was in Nigeria where the aim is everyone in Nigeria has to have an ID card with their photograph on it to be able to vote and access government services. And the technology refused to recognize a person with Down syndrome as having a face. So that's that for voting in Nigeria. Now they, so, you know, we are seeing, as I say, some real interest here. And we're poised to launch a, a website. We're just, there's no money, there's not a penny on this. I mean, we're just, what they talk about on the side of the desk, this is under the desk and in the bin, you know, we're just, but I found a little bit in my pocket to put up this website. And we're even talking about crowdfunding to bring some money in because what you see time and time again, the most prestigious institutions in the world, like the last paper out of Stanford that are looking at ethics and AI, they talk about race and gender and maybe LGBTQ, never talk about disability. The silence 
is stunning. And so we need to capture their attention. And people with disabilities and their advocacy groups need to be making a fuss, a big fuss. It's interesting that it's the business-led community that's starting to address this. And how can people join join the forces? I mean, how can how do you get involved in this? Well, what can I um, give to the people listening and, and our registrants? Well, email me and then we'll okay. let you all know when the website goes up. Because the intention for the website is to be some kind of a kind of campaign-y thing um, right. where you can go to say, look, this is the problem. And these are some of the propositions in terms of who could do what that would start to address it. And these are some of the leading players that would be happy to connect. And, you know, we want comments up there and so on. Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll share it. I'll, yeah. I'll do whatever. I'll, I'll join it. <laughs> I, I seem to remember you managed to convince one major organization to pull the AI recruitment tool. Um, yes, but I don't think I want to talk about that um, because oh. we're not sure quite how that's working out now. Okay. But, but we did see one employer. I do think we're seeing increasing nervousness on the part of uh, the HR community that actually using this technology is going to raise the risks for their organizations in ways that will cause the chief exec to kind of blink if they find mm -hmm. out. And so, you know, the, one of the biggest problems we've got, of course, is that it's not just the AI developers that don't understand disability discrimination. The HR people who buy it don't understand it. Understand. Disability discrimination, which is why I called it that meeting on the convention review for a complete review of the mm -hmm. training and accreditation of the HR profession, because somehow they graduate not understanding that a standardized process is discriminatory. How can that be? Something wrong with their training. It's like, a, you go to your doctor and he says, I'm sorry, what's a knee? <laughs> no, you're supposed to know. <laughs> Susan, you're so spot on with everything you say. It, it's like, we know these things, but we don't articulate it or we don't, you know, it, it's so, it's on a peripheral, I don't know, and you just go bam like that. It's like that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's extraordinary. Yeah. Maybe you should write a how to guide, you know, the, like 10 well, simple steps for people to do and make sure and push that through and make sure everybody, every organization or every HR manager or every everybody does it because it, it, it's 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 got to be it's got to be simple. Hasn't it for people to grasp it and do it. And the, and it's the too first, complicated, nothing gets done. <laughs> the first, and the first thing on the list, of course, is learn directly from disabled people. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the magic of the Valuable 500 campaign and Purple Light Up coming together with the ILO's global network, because the senior players are starting to learn directly from their own disabled colleagues. Mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned the Canadian government's work, Nasser. They put out in the public domain the result of their consultation with their disabled colleagues. And yes, it's taking too long to get adjustments, 80% had to get a letter from their doctor to prove that you should be obliged to make it easier for them to do their jobs and all of that. But that was a serious effort to listen to their own people and, and make improvements on the strength of that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if there's nothing else that we ever said to any senior leader in government or the private sector, then listen to your customers with disabilities, listen to your colleagues with disabilities and start talking to your potential colleagues. Why aren't they applying to you? Where are they going? What's going on? Um, we have uh, five, is that 10 minutes, uh, Anna, well, for six questions? Six minutes left. Six uh, minutes, I, yeah. If there are I, any questions from the audience, um, we'd love to they, have them. Before they ask, I mean, uh, increasingly our, our global clients want us to help them with um, making those adjustments in other countries. Any advice on which countries are readier than others or do you think it's just going to be as tough as 25 years ago in uk so this is which countries do you are... think that would be uh, easier to implement this kind of a kind of workplace adjustment principle rather than medical model well i think the um i probably start with where you've got business disability networks mm -hmm. and so the new one in india um, is doing some good work, the one in China. Uh, the Philippines is really motoring. You know, so you would look for where you've got business disability networks that are 
facilitating the communication between people with disabilities and the sector and business. I'd look for allies that have already got a track record for mm -hmm. meeting the needs of business. So Enable India that I know you know, who can help you define the suppliers. I mean, the, if you, we start generalizing about countries, countries that have got strong quotas like Germany are tough mm -hmm. because the employment quotas for well, the one in Germany has been there since World War I ended 1919. They've had a hundred years to prove it doesn't work or they probably wouldn't still need it. But they, of course, because of the way that legislation is framed and communicated, the business community has a distorted understanding of who's disabled and what it's really all about. It's, it's, it's hard for them to break through that, which is actually why the MyAbility Network in Vienna and the Unternehmens Forum in Frankfurt is starting to, they're starting to make some headway, but it's, it's hard going. Um, so, no, you can't really generalize. I think my instinct is always to go with the company, make sure that the company's got clarity in terms of the values and the messaging that mm -hmm. are driving what they want to do. So GSK's Global Disability Confidence Council um, is absolutely clear. They're grounded in, you know, we treat our people properly and fairly, and uh, it's workplace adjustment process there um, that, uh, that Andy Garrett runs is absolutely aligned to their values in terms of how they want to treat people. Well, and well is aligned, of course, to the need for the business to be as productive and to get as their employees as engaged as possible. You have something to do with that, don't you? Nasa? But, but we, he's, <laughs> driving us, he's driving us very hard, I must say. Andy, now we've just done it in Belgium, in Ireland. Uh, we've been in US with him. So he's asking for Poland and other countries, like India. So you're right, he's yeah, actually determined to push through and he's, he's doing a great job. And we thought he was a nice guy. Uh, he's, he's definitely, he's definitely <laughs> putting us, uh, no, he's definitely putting us through our, um, <laughs> in our wits. Now he's, uh, but, but we're enjoying it, it's a, it's a big challenge. I mean, well, setting up supply chain in different parts of the world and trying to operate to their regulatory um, in environment is, is, is obviously challenging, but we manage it. I think that's where the company has to make it clear that they're not into compliance thinking. Absolutely. Compliance messages, I'm only going to treat you properly if I have to. Mm. And so no matter what the regulation is, the mm. company needs to have a standard that says we want to deliver our adjustments within 20 days or whatever it is. It doesn't matter what local regs say because no local reg is going to stop them from doing that. Actually, what the one challenge was, like in um, one in Belgium, apparently, if you do receive products for your disability, then it's got some uh, benefit in kind tax implication. Oh yeah, when you're working at home and they give you the. That's furniture. right. So, so hence these are the regulatory um, challenges. But the second thing they find obviously challenging is cultural. But in, you see, in a, when, I, when I heard that with Andy, of course, I said, so just pay it because it's like yeah. 20 quid. Yes, <laughs> it's, but it, I think it probably costs a lot more than 20 quid to, to work at the administration. That's the problem with them. But you're right. It's just tiny little issues that needs to be ironed out. And in America, for example, again, uh, not just uh, GSK, but other clients we went, the uptake is very low. It's some people don't have trust maybe in the outcome. They think that if I do this, I might lose my job. That's another and, one. That's the company's job is to constantly communicate success. Mm. No, absolutely. And constantly that's getting out the message that says, this is absolutely brilliant. We might have lost this really great manager and now look what's going on here. Mm, indeed. It's constantly, what did you say? Constantly? Communicate. Communicate, thank you. My brain went dead. Be proud of the service. Call it a service. Yeah, we've got a workplace adjustment service, and once a year we we invite everyone who's used it yeah. to feedback yeah. customer yeah. satisfaction, and we no, tell the no. world we've got ninety percent satisfaction, no. or we have forty, and we have to fix it. But I the, do remember when we went uh, live with uh, Lloyd's Banking Group in two thousand ten. It took two years for people to actually come through and trust their process, yeah. and it hasn't stopped since. So it's been a great success story. Mm. Um, that, 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 that it does take time to, to, uh, to give people confidence. One thing I, I can uh, share because it was public, um, uh, Lloyds Bank uh, reported the narrowest gap in the disability, uh, in engagement score between disabled and non-disabled colleagues. And all, they attributed that all to because of the 
uh, workplace adjustment they put in, in in 2010. And it's been consistent every year. It's been the same. Great. Well done, so, you well, so, so I think there is, there is success. There is good stories in that, for, for sure. I, I've got to stop you because we are on the hour, but I do have one final question because it's been a wonderful conversation and I, I've got an awful lot out of it. And I hope also the, the people listening have, um, have also got a lot of uh, sound bites out of it. But I, I just want to say, um, what would you do if you had a magic wand that could change the system? What would you do if you could do anything, Susan? Um, well, um, in 10 seconds, what would I do? I would change the way HR people are trained and I would change the way that the disability sector is funded. It should be right. funded so they provide a service to the business community that business rates. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Those two things, because it's both sides of the table. We cannot just endlessly say it's about business. It's a much wider systemic issue. And I would like the equality and human rights bodies around the world to start to publicly come out saying it's time to change our way of looking at disability that would be kind of cool and i must thank you again susan for thank spending you. the hour with us it was very 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 interesting and thank, thank you for thanks. sharing your experience and your knowledge well thank you and thank you to everyone um, and next week we have um another yeah. um, um, jenny uh, lay flurry all right microsoft um, yeah microsoft yeah yeah, we're looking forward to that. And that one's on my birthday. <gasps> okay, <laughs> good. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much, Susan. It's, been, it's been a pleasure again. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.